Welcome to module 10. In this module, you will be introduced to the anatomy of the cardiovascular system. By definition, the system is composed of the heart and the blood and lymphatic vessels. However, only the heart and the major blood vessels will be discussed in this part of the lecture. The first part is focused on the anatomy of the heart, both external and internal structures. And the second part of the module will discuss further the blood vessels exiting the heart and its major branches with emphasis on the organs or structures it supply. Information on the main venous drainage will be discussed after the arterial supply. At the end of this module, you should be able to identify the external and internal anatomy of the heart and trace the arterial and venous system of the different parts of the body. As mentioned, the cardiovascular system is consists of the heart, the blood vessels, and the lymphatic vessels. The heart constitutes the muscular pump of the cardiovascular system. The blood vessels consisting of the arteries, veins, and the capillaries form a continuous system in which the blood circulates in the body. The main function of the system is to circulate the blood. It provides the metabolic requirement nutrition, wastes, removal, and protection of the body via blood cells. Blood in animal is around 6 to 8 percent of the total body weight. Circulation time is around 30 seconds in large animals or as fast as 7 seconds in cats. The system has two types of circulation and normally in a figure of 8 fashion as you can see here. The pulmonic circulation is through the right side of the heart to the lungs while the systemic circulation is through the left side of the heart to the heart itself and to the rest of the body. Now let us begin with the most important part of the system, the heart. The heart is a muscular four-chambered organ that pumps blood in the circulatory system. In dog, the heart is ovoid in shape with a blunt apex. The chambers include the right atrium and ventricles and the left atrium and ventricles. The heart is enclosed by the pericardium. This is a double-walled membrane heart sac enclosing the heart. It is composed of an outer fibrous pericardium and an inner serous pericardium. Further, the serous pericardium is divided into a parietal pericardium and a visceral pericardium. The visceral part is also known as the epicardium. The space between the two layers of the serous pericardium is called the pericardial space. And in the space, we can see the pericardial fluid that prevents the friction between the heart itself and the pericardial sac. Here is a schematic illustration showing the layers of the pericardium. At the same time, we can now see the three layers of the heart wall. The epicardium is the external layer. It is also part of the serous layer of the pericardium. The myocardium is the middle layer. This is the thickest and the actual heart muscle, while the endocardium is the inner layer and it lines the heart chambers and the valves. Here is a heart enclosed with the pericardial investments, and let us locate some of the parts that can be seen externally. The base of the heart is the dorsal and the cranial part of the heart. This is associated with the atria and the great vessels like the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. The apex is the blunt ventral end of the heart. Please note that the apex of the heart is formed solely by the left ventricle. Now let us check the chambers. In this left lateral view, we can see the four chambers. Here is the right atrium, the right ventricle, the left atrium, and the left ventricle. If we remove the pericardial sac, we can now see clearly the demarcation between the chambers as shown here. We can also see here the coronary groove. This is partially encircling the heart, making a separation between the atria and the ventricles externally. Likewise, from the coronary groove to the apex, we can see the interventricular groove, separating the two ventricles depending on their side. There are two interventricular grooves. The paraconal groove is on the left side, while the subsinosal groove is on the right side. 
In this slide, we can also recognize some of the great vessels at the base of the heart. Here is the pulmonary trunk, and here is the aorta with the aortic arc and its main branches. We will discuss them when we tackle in details the blood vessels. In between these two arteries is the ligamentum arteriosum. If you recall your embryology course, this is the remnant of the fetal ductus arteriosus connecting the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. Now let us discuss the structures per chambers of the heart. Let us begin with the right atrium. The right atrium forms the right dorsocranial part of the base. It is the chamber that receives the deoxygenated blood from the body. Here is the interior of the right atrium. The sinus vena cava is the main part. This is the actual space occupied by the right atrium being filled by the blood. The right auricle is the blind-ended part of the right atrium. This looks like an ear, thus with the name auricle. In some cases, the auricle and the atria are interchangeably used. However, it is important to note that the atrium is the main part and the auricle is just a part of the said chamber. The intervenous tubercle is a transverse ridge between the openings of the two vena cava. Note that the cranial and caudal vena cava enter the heart at the right atrium. To orient you, here is the caudal vena cava and the cranial vena cava. And here is the intervenous tubercle. This structure prevents the backflow of the blood. You can also see here the oval fossa. This is the remnant of the foramen ovale. Remember that during embryonic development, the two atria are communicating with one another via the foramen ovale, thus allow the mixing of oxygenated and unoxygenated blood between the two chambers. However, in adult, this should be closed and the remnant is the oval fossa located at the interarterial septum. The interarterial septum separates the two atria. The internal wall of the atrium is studded with muscular bands or also known as the pectinate muscles. This forms the irregular ridges on the internal surface of the atrium. Please take note that the right atrium has also the following openings. The cranial and caudal vena cava is where the blood from the systemic circulation is entering the heart. The coronary sinus is where the coronary arteries are connected supplying the blood supply of the heart while the right atrioventricular orifice is where the blood is exiting the right atrium to the right ventricle. Now we have the right ventricle. The right ventricle is the chamber of the heart receiving blood from the right atrium and sending it to the lungs. Again, here is the external location of the right ventricle. And here is the pulmonary trunk delivering the blood to the lungs for oxygenation. In between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk is a funnel-shaped structure, the conus arteriosus. This is the expanded outflow of the right ventricle to the pulmonary trunk. The supraventricular crest separates the conus to the main chamber of the right ventricle. Inside the ventricle, we can see easily the papillary muscles. These are the conical-shaped muscular projection, and generally, there are three papillary muscles in the right ventricle. Extending from these papillary muscles are the chordae tendinae. These are the fibrous strands anchoring the free edges of the AV valves to the papillary muscles, preventing the eversion of the valve's cusps. Commonly, these are referred to as the heart strings. The right ventricle also possesses the trabeculae septomarginalis or the moderator band. This connects the right wall of the right ventricle to the interventricular septum as shown here, preventing the overpumping of the ventricle. Also at the right ventricle, we can see the right atrioventricular valve or the tricuspid valve. It has three cusps, thus with the name tricuspid valve. The left atrium forms the left dorsocaudal part of the base. It receives oxygenated blood from the lungs via the pulmonary veins. Anatomically, it is similar to the right atrium both in structure and in shape. Here you can see the left auricle. It has the following openings. 
the pulmonary veins where the blood from the lungs are entering the heart and the left av opening where the blood from the left atrium is exiting to enter the left ventricle finally the last chamber is the left ventricle it forms the apex of the heart and has the thickest wall among the heart compartments here is an image comparing the wall thickness of the left and right ventricles take note that the left is thicker than the right at the left ventricle we can see the left atrioventricular valve it has two cusps thus with the name bicuspid valve anatomists in the past associated this valve with the appearance of the bishop's mitre thus they often refer this valve as the mitral valve just like the right ventricle the left ventricle has papillary muscles these are attached to the chordae tendinae to the cusps of the valves in the case of the left ventricle only two papillary muscles are present the left ventricle has two openings one is the aortic orifice and the other one is the left av orifice the aortic orifice is the opening to the ascending aorta it is closed by the aortic valve the heart has four valves two valves separating the right and left atria and ventricles and two valves for the great vessels the aorta and the pulmonary artery the valves are composed of several cusps and we can use this to identify them aside from their location each cusps has a name but this is not important at our level the first valve is the right atrioventricular valve it has three cusps thus called tricuspid valve this is located between the right atrium and the right ventricle. Next is the left AV valve or the bicuspid valve or also known as the mitral valve. This valve is located between the left atrium and the left ventricle. To remember the order of which comes first between the right and left AV valves, always remember, try before you buy or tricuspid before bicuspid. Next, we move to the valves associated with the great vessels of the heart. They are both often termed as the semilunar valves. Both of them has three cusps. Here is the pulmonary valve between the right atrium and the pulmonary artery. And here is the aortic valve between the left ventricle and the aorta. Now we know the different parts of the heart. We can now at least trace the blood flow in the heart. Blood coming from the general circulation will enter the heart via the cranial and caudal vena cava as shown here. Blood coming from the cranial part of the animal like the head, thoracic limb, and the upper thoracic cavity will empty at the cranial vena cava, while the blood from the caudal part of the animal body like the abdominal area and the pelvic limb will empty their blood at the caudal vena cava. The blood will enter the right atrium and will exit at the AV orifice to enter the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, the blood will be pumped to the pulmonary arteries, to the lungs, and will be oxygenated. The oxygenated blood will return to the heart via the pulmonary veins. It will then enter the left atrium and then to the left ventricle. The blood will then be pumped by the left ventricle to the aorta to be delivered to the rest of the body via the systemic circulation. And that ends the part of this module. As a recap, the heart is a four-chambered organ with various structures in each chamber. You should be able to at least locate them in each chamber. Likewise, after being able to locate the parts, you can now trace the blood flow in the heart. You may now proceed to part 2 of this module which is the arterial and the venous system in the body.